Yes, before we start, one thing that uh, came to my mind, and lest I forget it, mm-hmm. given the amount of uh, superstition and pseudoscience, uh, I admired what you are doing. So, <laughs> probably that's uh, usually the last thing that said uh, at the end of a conversation. But let this be the first thing I want to say. Why? Why would you say that? I'm curious. Because I'm fighting the same thing, mm. a kind of uh, bias, mm. subjectivity, ill-placed belief in oneself, mm. and uh, dogmatic, uh, yeah, self-confidence that's going around. Right. I suppose that's what is. Uh, killing everybody including the very planet right so we need much much more of uh, what you are attempting right and we need many many more professionals to come out and uh, and speak for the facts otherwise everybody is uh, touting his opinions and that mm, is no good right it doesn't take anybody anywhere Yes, we can start. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and in fact, that makes it a great starting point for our conversation. Yes. Because um, I am, I have always been a scientific student. Mm-hmm. I did my MBBS, my MD, and then I did three years in neurology. Mm. And all of my belief systems are informed through what I have read in my medical textbooks right. and through scientific textbooks. Right. And now when I think about spirituality and mm. I have been thinking about spirituality mm. the first problem that I came across was is this a soft science is this is there any way I can confirm this can the same principles of science be applied in my study of spirituality so today I have this golden opportunity to sit with you you are most one of the welcome. foremost experts of spirituality in our country most welcome. so I would like to start this conversation in that point, which is for a scientific student, how should they approach spirituality? You see, science uh, is hard. Hard in the sense that it uh, leaves no scope for subjective feelings or emotions or biases, right? A fact is a fact. And a fact is a fact if uh, it is. Uh, Verifiable, falsifiable, replicable. Replicable. Somebody else can come and test it. And it can be tested not just today, but at any point in time. And if there is even a single observation that negates my hypothesis, then my theory stands rejected. Yes. So there is a constant attempt, a very rigorous attempt in science to not to let the ego interfere, the self interfere. Right. I might like the fact, I might not like the fact, that doesn't matter. Right. I'm measuring the time period of a simple pendulum and I might be running a fever. Right. That doesn't alter the reading. I might be in a very bad mood. A man measures the thing, a woman reads the observation, they are they are supposed to be the same, black or white, young or old. In that sense, the, the person doesn't count. And if that be the definition of hard, then spirituality is harder. Because you have to be your own witness. Here you are witnessing something that you might only be very superficially connected to. You know, that's a pendulum. Yeah. And I've inherited that from my grandmother. So there might be some relationship. Yeah. And you're observing the pendulum. Yeah. But what is spirituality? Spirituality is self-knowledge. Spirituality is not about spirits. It is about the self. Right. So, Adhyatma is Atmagyan. Spirituality is self-knowledge. 
So what is to be observed? The self. Right? And with the self, the self has a relationship of identity. I am that. I am myself. Yes. But it is harder. Because all kinds of biases and prejudices are bound to creep in. Yes. Witnessing is the heart of all self-observation. You know? Absolutely. If you, if you cannot look at yourself neutrally, without attachment, without conclusions, without biases, without your images, if you cannot look at yourself, there can be no self-knowledge. You would be in an echo chamber. You would be just listening to what you already think about yourself. Right. You know, you would never come to see who you really are. So in that sense, spirituality is harder. But that leads us into a problem. Hmm. The problem is that if you mess up in science, somebody else would come and catch you. Hmm? If you publish something, there is always a provision for peer review, yes. for example. Yes. In spirituality, there can be no peer review because you are to be your own observer. And if you are uh, adamantly insisting, you know, I'm already good. No, no, I'm not afraid. No, I'm not greedy. Right. Huh? There is no way somebody else can come and conclusively prove to you that you are uh, misplaced. So, while spirituality is harder, it is also vulnerable to being inexact, biased, and corruptible. Mm. And we see that all around us, don't we? Mm. How the whole field gets corrupted. Yes. And uh, that is why science is luckier. And that's why we could have a linear progress in science. One could build on the knowledge of the other. Others. You know, we are standing on the shoulders of giants, as somebody Absolutely. said. In spirituality, it is not possible to stand on somebody else's shoulder. Right. You have to do your own work. Every human starts from the Stone Age. So this wonderful. Very well said. Very well said. I have debated this question multiple times with myself and with others and I have to say that is one of the clearest answers to that question that I've ever gotten. Thank you, Thank you so much because that correlation between spirituality and science where spirituality is the study of the self, all the problems that science faces, a, somebody in a spiritual pursuit also faces. Right. In science, when somebody is publishing a research paper, in the end, every author is supposed to write conflict of interest. Ah. Uh -huh. Wonderful, wonderful. But in spirituality, when you are observing yourself, when do you declare conflict of interest? <laughs> that disclaimer has to be perpetual. Right. You know, because I am my own observer, so I am very, very likely to be biased. Yes. In spite of my best efforts, some degree of bias would creep in. And that's, that's the very definition of humility. Yeah. To know that you are imperfect. That even if you are trying your best, you know, some degree of evolutionary, physical, psychological baggage will make itself felt. You know, I have uh, noticed, and this is a common thing around doctors, which is that you could be a great doctor a great surgeon, as long as you're operating on people you don't know. Uh. But if I have to operate on my wife, my son, my daughter, yes. my hands will shake. Right. So at the highest level of science and knowledge also, when things get personal, right. all science right. starts becoming shaky. Right. I now understand why spirituality is difficult. What is the way out then? Because nobody else can do my spiritual journey for me. Right, right. To see that all science will become not only useless, but actively harmful mm. if there is absence of self-knowledge. You see, science gives the one within tremendous power, especially after science evolves into usable technology. Mm. Mm? So, there is me. There is this world. Let's start with this dualistic model. Mm. There is somebody in here who is the perceiver of the world, who is the doer of deeds, 
and uh, who is the user of technology there is somebody in here and there is the world out there science means i know this world more meticulously now mm. which means i can use these resources mm. towards the appeasement of my desire mm. in a more intense way mm. but since i don't know myself i'm not spiritual since i don't know myself hence i do not know where my spirit desire is coming from mm. therefore it's like a monkey now having access mm. to the nuke button Mm-hmm. I remain that same primordial thing within, but externally I have gained a lot of power. Right. So, as science progresses, mm. it becomes all the more uh, important, uh, rather, uh, how should I put it, mandatory, that spirituality should progress in equal proportion. Right. Science without spirituality. is is disastrous and that's what is happening on this planet today what else is this entire specter of climate change correct you know we correct. we we know so much about the world we today uh, are scientifically economically more progressed than we ever were in our evolutionary history right and what has been the result of that progress we probably are uh, entering the sixth mass extinction phase right. and this one is man made Right. Um, the previous five were not right so in the era of great scientific progress uh, spirituality becomes uh, mandatory something that just you know cannot avoid indispensable mm. so here i have a conflict on the one hand yes absolutely if i think about the scientific progress that has gone behind say me eating a chocolate cake right so cocoa seeds from africa flown here big industries making that cake making sure it's shipped to me but in the end the final result is me eating that cake to give me a dopamine spike right to make the monkey in me happy right all of this technological progress just for that one pleasure right, right. but on the other hand isn't that core motivation what is driving technology forward aren't we doing things because we are basically monkeys at heart yeah so then we aren't doing anything for ourselves then you see if the net result of that entire scientific endeavor Mm. was to raise the dopamine level mm. then everything was done by dopamine for itself i didn't do anything mm. whatever was done was done by dopamine mm. because the net result was an increase in that pleasure that dopamine level yes the dopamine level yes right so we know how systems operate we also know that within systems variables can have a tendency to maximize themselves Mm. so this too is a system and yes. within this system a, a variable can have a tendency to maximize itself right so or because you come from that background mm. the ribby's example might be particularly instructive mm-hmm. you know the the virus is now there in the dog's body and uh, the virus makes the dog bite someone correct so that the virus can enter the other body did the dog bite the other person no it was the virus that made the dog bite the other person mm. similarly did i opt for chocolates no i didn't it was a dopamine that made me opt for chocolates mm. so so the dog has done nothing it's the virus that is commanding the dog mm. similarly who am i if i am being commanded by my physical composition i am then nobody mm. and then there is no dignity in life because then i am a slave to my chemicals my hormones and other things okay. uh, there is no there is no consciousness then yes. because at the, at the heart of consciousness lies the ability to witness yourself lies the ability to not be dictated by your mechanical chemical biological uh, composition right we have reached consciousness way too early in the conversation because <laughs> i have realized that this is the hard problem of science right. once we reach consciousness um there are very few paths to go from there i want to i want to take 
a slight step back to understand some core aspects of i'm going to say hinduism because you said a word adhyatma and i have there are a few terms like this which do get used but i feel people might not know their uh, the root meaning so can i ask you the meanings of some words like wonderful, this wonderful, wonderful. so adhyatma you mentioned was knowledge of knowing oneself deeply the atma so adhi atma no not not atma okay the one that you are the self ha atma is a pointer towards the purest self possible Hmm. adhyatma does not refer to knowing the atma atma is is conceptually so pure that it cannot be known hmm it's unknowable agyeya hmm so adhyatma refers to knowing who you are as a fact not who you are in the utopian sense in the idealistic sense hmm so adhyatma is about knowing the very uh, basic facts of your existence for example yes i am envious that's adhyatma ah oh yes i am covetous that's adhyatma adhi adhi what does adhi refer to more more that's uh, from where adhik comes yes. adhikya so atma the self hmm. not atma not at ah. self you as you are in your in your normal day to day life is that what is referred to as mindfulness not really because man mm. mind is just the aggregation of objects around the atma so this atma is more correctly referred to as aham mm. i me ahankar right and this aham is a basic uh, sense of psychological incompleteness so to fill itself up it gathers stuff around itself right for the sake of feeling secure or feeling complete so those objects all you know sit in the mind right. and the aggregation of those objects and the relationships between them mm. all that taken together is defined as the mind or man so man is the entire structure around aham aham is the center mm. and man is the universe around that center mm. there is a uh, there are levels to reality i had read this somewhere that there is a subjective reality and there's an objective reality so that mind that we create around us seems to be the subjective reality that subjective. we create yes yes the a branch of hinduism is advaita am i saying it correctly is it a branch of hinduism it is the very basis of sanatan okay you so see, i don't understand this concept at all so could okay, you I'll, i'll i'll bring it to you using uh, the subjectivity paradigm that you just initiated yeah you see there is the subjective purely subjective universe in which you are the lord and you can think of anything you know subjectively i feel i'm a better tennis player than federer and i'm entitled to do that right. nobody can dispute that so that is taken as the lowest level of reality that you could call as the imaginary reality right. but even that is real to me even that is real to me yes then a higher level of reality is the factual reality it is a reality that you would probably corroborate if i say for example there stands a wall you would attest that yes i agree that's a wall and such things that different beings at different times can verify to each other are known as facts right. what else is the definition of a fact i to have only my senses to finally determine that something is that something exists yes and the same thing yeah, you to do so that is uh, factual reality right hmm? and then there is the highest reality 
in which you say, fine, that's the wall out there, but who is the one in here who is looking at the wall? And here you want to look at both of these together. And when you can look at both of these together, mm. that's taken as the highest reality, truth, satya. 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 So you, you start from kalpana, that's uh, called the pratibhasic level, imaginary level. You move to a higher level, that's called the tathyatmak, factual level or vyavaharic level, practical level. Mm. And then you come to the highest level. That highest level is the level of truth, satya or paramarth, paramarthic level. So, advait, that what you said. Huh? Advait is the topmost level. Okay. The entire spiritual journey is about ascending from these two to the highest. So, advait is the very end of the entire Sanatan journey. Understood. In biological terms, uh, when I read neuroscience, I had this one moment where the walls broke for me. Oh. Because I suddenly realized while I was reading, and I remember the chapter, I was reading about eye physiology. So the how light goes into the eye and then how does those electric signals travel through the brain until finally we are aware of what we are seeing. Mm. And I was reading it from the perspective of a medical student, but I suddenly realized that, oh, which means that what I'm seeing and what is actual reality is separated by a lot of electric currents. Yes, yes. And time. And time. And time. So I'm always looking at the past. Always looking at the past. I can never look at the present. I am never in the present. So there is nothing called living in the present. It's not possible. In, in not the conventional way. No, biologically impossible, impossible to live in the present. Yes. And I had to put the book down because, <laughs> you know, you have a bit of existential crisis that, wait, what is real? Um, so after I went through that, I, I, I think I went through these three levels in half an hour, uh, which made me think that maybe a lot of what is written in these textbooks actually refer to these very real biological phenomenon. But because they were using different words, scientists are not referring to those books. Right. Because now all of this makes sense to me even from a neuroscience perspective. Right. Now, in Advaita, what is the path in Advaita to reach the highest level. The path is to examine any path you have chosen for yourself. That is the path. So, so Advaita is the pathless path. Mm. Advaita says, anybody and everybody at any given point is on some path or the other. And what is a path about? A path is about your mental complexes, your desires, your choices. That's your path, right? So, so at this moment, for example, one might be very concerned about, oh, I have to go and shop and the whole thing closes at nine. No? Yeah. So, so that's the path. Somebody is saying, I want to meditate. For that person, that's the path. Somebody is on some other way, some other desire, some other project, that's the path. Right. A path is not necessarily religious or whatever. No? Mm. Path simply means the direction that the mental space is taking. Now that space in everybody does have some direction because none of us are settled beings. None of us is yet on the mountain top. So we are constantly in a flux. We are moving. The way of Advait is observe your movement, observe your path. And that's all. So there is no particularly prescribed path and there is no proscribed path either. Mm. There is nothing that Advait Vedant specifically negates or prohibits. Mm. It says, you are, here is your life, here is this movement, here are your choices, look at yourself, look at yourself. So I could be on my path right now just by knowing that I am here talking to you and this is how I feel and this is the truth. The truth is when you can see how these two realities, the one within and the one that you are experiencing outside are one. Hmm. Otherwise, there is an artificial sense of separation. 
Mm. One feels that there is this universe and there is me. Mm. And we two are distinct. But when these two can be seen together, then the separation falls. Mm. And that is non-duality. No, no, I'll, I'll, I will not go into non-duality. Mm. We'll understand what duality yeah. includes, first of all. And that will probably help us uh, with a pointer towards non-duality. You see, if I do not know myself, if I do not know myself, and some wonderful, delicious aroma comes wafting, hmm? I would insist, I want that food item. Yes. I want that food item. Yes. In the sense, there's that food item, and there is me, and the two of us are separate, and it's my decision mm. to want that food item. Mm. Or, if I'm walking down a road, and I look at a hoarding carrying an advertisement, yeah. and there is a new model of a mobile phone displayed, I'll say, I want that phone. Yes. It's a sovereign decision I have made. To be able to look at these two together means, I'm able to see how my internal processes have all been governed by that external fact mm. that I do not exist independently of that aroma or that holding. Mm. That what I call as my desire is nothing but a function of what I am perceiving mm. on the outside. You're responding or reacting to... I'm just reacting like a chemical. Mm. There is no difference. Mm. There is just no difference. Mm. Chemical A falls on chemical B. Does chemical B have a choice? No. Similarly, I smelled that food item and I said I want it. Did I really have any choice? Potentially, probably I had. Potentially, maybe. But the way we live, we have no choice. Mm. Since we have no choice, therefore, I could say we are enslaved. Mm. And that's where human suffering lies. Yeah. So, so, so that's the usual duality we live in. Mm -hmm. And then, this was a case of that informing this, that making this a function of itself, that is the food item or the advertisement. Now that has been able to colonize this. Or that has been able to penetrate here and get implanted. The whole thing can be seen uh, in a reverse way as well. I want something. I want something. Or let's say I'm looking for somebody. Mm. And there is an entire crowd somewhere there. What do I end up looking at? Only that face that I have been looking for. Yes. If somebody asks me who all are there in that crowd, I won't be able to answer. Correct. Because it's somebody particular I'm looking for. Yeah. So what has happened? The nature of that crowd, to me, has been determined by me. Mm. To me, that crowd is that one person. Yes. To somebody else, that crowd could be some other person. Somebody else, yes. So what is happening now is that this is informing that. Mm. Yes. So in, in the first circumstance, uh, the advertisement is informing you. Me. And the second circumstance, you are informing the environment. And in practical life, these two do not happen alternately. Mm. They both happen together. They happen together. Mm. Then that's duality. Mm. Where I am dependent on that and that is dependent on me. Mm. And at least one of us two thinks that he is independent. <laughs> and this is called Maya. Illusion. You think you are independent, you are not. You're not. And, and it's not just a matter of fact that you're not independent. It is a matter of suffering. Because you're not independent, therefore your desires are not yours. Therefore you spend your life chasing something that you never actually needed to chase. Right. Anyone who has been through a relationship and has broken up uh, will see the face of their ex everywhere they go. 
even somebody who looks slightly like that person they will remind them of them because now the brain is constantly walking around with that reference in mind i'll give an example somebody quoted it to me i found it instructive is that i'm about to buy a particular model mm. of car now mm. he says uh, when i'm traveling down the express way yeah all i notice is that particular model there are so many cars but my eyes always come to rest on that particular model yes so that's how we determine the external reality yeah. and nobody could 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 authentically claim that uh, there is an objective universe really yeah this universe that we think of is a function of who we are right hmm? uh, science would uh, very very openly agree to that you see the colors that we are looking at are determined by the capacity of these eyes yes. and the optical nerves yes 4000 angstrom 8000 angstrom right less than that more than this yeah the the universe does not exist not that we cannot see yeah. we will say the universe does not exist, exist. yeah less than 20 hertz more than 20000 hertz nobody said anything no sound nobody said anything not that i cannot hear not that nothing is being said nobody said anything so we we remove the existence of that thing itself yes and we superimpose something mm. on the nature of the universe itself we do not say that it is my projection we say the universe is an objective reality in which only 20 to 20000 hertz exist yes hmm? put it this way hmm interesting question you you'll relish this one if there is something you can neither see hmm nor hear nor smell nor touch and not even think of hmm. does that thing exist no <laughs> so the definition of existence itself depends on my sensory capabilities the definition of existence itself so what is the universe then an objective reality correct can there anything be objective there is nothing called an objective reality you know everything that is objective owes its existence yeah to my senses and if something falls totally outside the purview of my senses it ceases to exist the universe is gone Correct. Uh, somebody would say, oh, but you know, if I cannot look at something, does it not exist? Suppose I close my eyes and walk into a pillar, won't I be hurt? I'm saying let's let's uh, let's tighten the conditions. Yeah. Something you cannot see, not even hear, and not even touch, touch, and, and not even mentate, not even think of. Now, does it exist? No. So the universe is very much dependent on my senses. there are so many levels to this um this this phrase that if a tree falls in the middle of the forest and there's nobody there to see it mm -hmm. did it really fall who knows uh if you observe a child a child is very entertained by this game called peekaboo okay because in that child's brain for those few seconds when you close the child's eyes or you disappear behind a curtain the child's brain is not able to grasp this concept that something can exist when it is not in front of me so when you come back out huh. the child is filled with surprise and giggles, oh, and giggles oh, yes <laughs> because it has in its in its brain it has solved a riddle right right so according to the child it has solved a major problem yes I realized now that you are saying this that you will never outgrow this. Out of sight, out of mind is is something that is always going to exist. When if you if you were to think of if our eye if our eyes became capable of seeing even a few wavelengths left and right of the spectrum, the world will look very different. Oh, the universe would expand. The universe would expand. The universe would expand if my eyes could uh, look at a wider spectrum. the universe itself would expand if my mind could think differently yeah. in different dimensions again the universe would expand so is there something called an objective universe or is it all dependent on me yeah i think physics is coping with this uh, when it is trying to deal with dark matter 
and it is trying to deal with subatomic particles because these are things that don't lend themselves to let's say easy measurement they don't lend themselves to the framework in which there is an objective reality right now physics has come to a point where observations are being altered by the very presence of the observer yes now so so what do you do now you cannot say uh, this thing is you will also have to write the name of the observer <laughs> and mention the specific conditions under which the observation took place correct which is very new to science we never used to do that you know thing is a thing irrespective of who made that observation and such things we all right for the uh, purpose of humanistic uh, gratitude and expression we say newton's laws yeah but it Other, could have been anyone it would have, could have been anyone and you remove newton the laws remain as they are correct <laughs> but now physics has come to a point where you cannot say mm. that the thing exists independently of the observer so what you're saying is you can only avoid subjectivity up to a point you'll have to fully endorse subjectivity that's mm. advaita mm. ahameb hi kevalam all this is the great self and nothing else is so advait vedant is a is surrender to total subjectivity and that complete total subjective unit mm. hmm? that that ultimate unity mm. is called atma or brahm or satya the truth small little conflict here is that in the journey towards surrender the words sound a lot like self indulgence because we think of the self initially as me so it sounds almost narcissistic hmm. that i am everything but at the end also the words are the same but the meaning seems to be very different right right that's why in language care was taken to differentiate between these two one was called aham hmm. that which you call as yourself my identity my identity my personal self yeah. my little self yeah so that was the aham and that absolute self that was atma mm. and when the learned ones wrote about that in english they said self with a small s and self with a capital s capital s because these two must be seen as distinct otherwise as you very rightly said narcissism is just around the corner exactly you will equate these two and say i am the one exactly <laughs> i am the one that absolute reality is me <laughs> huh? me yeah. so so that me uh, siddharth me siddharth me siddharth me this embodied one yes. this one this one <laughs> so, i have a proposal i feel english needs to get updated and we should use small i and big i yes i mean small i would suffice <laughs> <laughs> because even the idea of using a big i for the self is quite uh, i now realize is quite narcissistic quite narcissistic you see this i that we talk of is actually not i mm. it is just uh, a play of chemicals right hmm? so there is no way this is to be confused with the pure or absolute self right this that we call as our existence isn't it so much material i mean uh, for example where is the personal consciousness sense the body doesn't exist doesn't exist is it possible to alter the body and yet let consciousness remain unaffected you know one drinks and what happens to consciousness yeah changes changes one falls and bangs his head and for 10 minutes one does not know what's going on yes so even simple physical events affect the consciousness so much this consciousness that we have is just a thing mm -hmm. just a thing so there is no way this thing can be equated with the self Mm. this consciousness that we have hmm? i mean 
since you come from that field, you know, are you not able to measure it? Yes, it's called Glasgow Coma Scale. You can okay. measure, right? You can put a number on it. I've very unfortunately, witnessed somebody's number fall and it slipped from six, five, four, three, and by the next morning we lost that person. Yeah, three is the lowest. Yes, 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 we lost that person. Yeah, and it was measurable. Yes, just like temperature is measurable. Yes. Just like pressure is measurable, just like any physical quantity is measurable. Okay. So this consciousness is certainly not me, because I am not a thing. But this consciousness is definitely a thing. It is affected by things, it is made by things. Just like things, it reacts to other things. Man looks at woman and reacts. Yes. Uh, uh, I touch something hot and it bulk away. Yes. I mean, it's a thing. It's a thing. So it's not to be confused with that. Mm. And that's why the path of uh, non-duality is the path of self-observation. The more you look at yourself, mm. the more you are astonished by your material nature. Who am I? I'm just material. And the funny thing is, the more you can see that you are material, mm. the more you are coming upon something that is beyond material. So the path towards non-material is through through material this is all that there is mm. there, there's nothing nothing beyond this there's, nothing beyond. there's me there's you they, we have these bodies yeah. there, there's nothing called supernatural reality right this is the world we inhabit and th this is all that we have right but this world makes us suffer and puts us in bondage we know the human condition right. here in america everywhere uh, we know what we are doing so this is the path this world is the path when we talk about the path, there is, and you also mentioned about what we are doing to the world, there is a lot of harm that is happening. Climate change is one. Um, violence seems to be a very core instinct of, I won't say human nature, I would say animal nature. Violence is there in nature. Lion hunts a deer. There is violence through the food chain. So why is it different when a human being participates in violence? No, that's not violence. That's that's chemicals dancing with each other. Hmm. You mean the intent? You're, the there is no intent. There is no intent. There is no intent. A lion has no intent. Hmm. Biologically, hmm. a lion is cap incapable of making a choice in favor of eating grass. Hmm. So how can there be intent? Hmm. The lion, by its physical, biological composition, mm. is not equipped to make a choice. So there is no violence. When a lion hunts down a deer, mm. that's not very different from a, a large polymer chain absorbing a small molecule into itself. Right. And that happens all the time. You know? Right. Hmm? Uh, molecules uh, merge into each other, they bond with each other, they do a lot of things with each other. Yes. What the lion is doing to the deer, it's much the same because the lion has no choice and in the absence of choice the word uh, violence is absurd right violence is only when i had a choice and i made the wrong one mm. so human beings can be violent a lion can neither be violent nor non-violent mm. ahinsa is not something that you can apply to any creature in the cosmos except man so, because of our ability to choose. Because our ability to choose. Yeah. And because of the fact that only we suffer if we don't choose rightly. Have you ever seen a lion suffering and repenting the life choices it made? Got it. You talked of the axe and the breakup. Right. And a lion, I, I don't suppose, uh, suffers in the same way and to the same intensity. Yeah. Huh? So man is the only one who has choice and the man is only one. By man I mean human beings, not really uh, man as in uh, male or female. No. So, so man is the only one who, 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 who is equipped to make choices and therefore man is the only one mm. who greatly suffers if he does not make the right choice. Mm. Non-violence is when you resolve to yourself, I'll make the right choice. That's non-violence or ahinsa. Mm. So that includes Mm. Not uh, uh, exploiting others for your petty gains. Mm. That includes that, but that's uh, not limited to that. Non-violence goes much beyond uh, your relationship with others. Mm. 
नॉन वायलेंस इज फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल अबाउट योर रिलेशनशिप विद योर सेल्फ सो देर इज ऑफन दिस आर्ग्यूमेंट एडवांस इन फेवर ऑफ फॉर एग्जाम्पल फ्लैश कंजम्पन राइट that uh, the should big you, should you consume non vegetarian food yeah people say you know the big fish is all the time eating the small fish and had the had had the creator god really wanted that animals should never be killed mm. then uh, he should have never made any carnivores mm. that's a very flawed argument why we are products of evolution no god ever made us first of all and second thing all the other products of evolution they are built differently mm. they are built differently lions for example probably don't even have any idea of their life span right. if a lion dies early i'm not I'm, i'm i don't think it would think in whatever way it thinks right that it's coming to an early death right uh, they behave in very very programmed and conditioned ways they do what their body tells them to do they are pretty innocent beings in that sense right you know no lion would ever save money right no lion would ever covet a throne mm. they do what they have been doing since uh, yeah they covet a throne in the sense they fight among themselves okay. for the leadership of the pack but that's what they have been doing since millions of years yeah nothing has changed nothing has changed and nothing can change because they they are like toys mm. they do what they are built to do mm. human beings are the only ones mm. and i'm not saying out the out of sense of entitlement uh, of uh, belonging to my species right i'm saying this out of my observation right. human beings are the only ones who have this special thing called a perpetual restlessness mm. we are born restless we want to know we gather knowledge we 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 feel around yeah. we ask questions Our curiosity we are we are curious yes and we do not like our inner state of incompleteness or discontentment right huh? and that for therefore the word called liberation applies only to human beings right we have never seen a cow yearning for liberation a cow is all right as it is right it would graze and uh, you know so non violence applies only to us and non violence is the only way to lead the right life mm. or the right life is called a non violent life you could put it this way a non violent life meaning you are causing you are not causing harm to other living creatures no you know who you are and therefore what is in your best interest how can i not cause harm to you mm. if i do not know who you are and if i do not know myself will i know you as a fellow human being mm -hmm. mm. you know this is a difficult concept to grasp because um for one i believe most people when it comes to food at least because it is such a core drive um there is more of an animal instinct when it comes yes, to food yes, as opposed to other yes, life choices yes, yes. uh so maybe they can make more mindful choices when it comes to buying a car or a phone but when it comes to food maybe the animal in you right. does seem to act more right. which is why the conversations around food are never polite there is always this uh tribal nature that comes That's out That's true but equally the kind of importance that food has in an animal's life mm. it does not have in a human being's life Mm. think of what a monkey does the entire day it looks around for food yes we don't do that we don't do that i mean sometimes we in fact skip meals and don't even remember we have skipped a meal yeah there are other more meaningful things in life and that's where lies the hint mm. why clamor so much for food when life has been enriched with so much more Mm. Mm? can't we find satisfaction in higher pursuits mm. it's a monkey that has to care so much about food mm. I, i mean as human beings mm. food probably occupies 2% 5% of our consciousness mm. and i don't suppose you would particularly like a person mm. if he is all the time dreaming of food mm. and if we do that then uh, we won't won't go too far in life so here's a difficult question which is from a spiritual perspective 
Is there reason to become a vegan? You see, first of all, it's not about the other. Okay. It's not about the chicken or the goat or the cow or the animal yeah. being milked. Yeah. Spirituality, he said, is Atmagyan, self observation. So it's about the self. So I suffer. I'm a human being. I'm born in this body. I suffer. And if I if I can see why I suffer, if I can see why I suffer, I realize there is a sense of incompleteness within. Mm. And that incompleteness makes me look at the entire world as a consumer, as an exploiter. Mm. I can look at the entire world as a hunter, as a consumer, which is all right, I can do that. What is not all right is that irrespective of the level, intensity, magnitude of my consumption, the incompleteness within just remains. Mm. Just remains. Yes. Just remains. I add this to my life, I accumulate that, so much I have gathered. No moral problem with that, one can gather. Hmm? The universe is not run through moral principles. You can do whatever you want and ultimately you can die and all that, fine. The problem is not uh, in the fact that you will die one day. The problem is you are alive and suffering and you are giving yourself a false treatment. As a doctor, you resonate with that. Hmm. I have not diagnosed my problem correctly and therefore I am offering myself one false treatment after the other. And what does that do to my condition? It worsens. It worsens. This holding tendency that we have to... Everything. Feel. Just everything. Just everything. Mm. I want to consume this. I want to consume that. And because an animal is helpless, so it can be consumed. Or milked. Mm. Or skinned. Mm. Whatever. Mm. The moment I see that, the very inclination to exploit the animal disappears. That doesn't really mean that you have to be an animal lover. That doesn't mean that. I, I for example, won't, won't consume a lot of things. That doesn't mean I love those things. And hence I'm not consuming them. The problem is, I kill animals and I do all kinds of vicious things. Because there is a hole in my heart. And when I start seeing that killing or whatever I'm doing, grabbing, clutching, all this is not in any way helping my condition. Mm. Then I do not want to put my energy in that direction. I don't want to put it. It's not. It's not about having mercy on the animal. Right. It's not about going and hugging the animal. It's about seeing that this thing won't help. Mm. Won't help. You have been doing this since ages. It never helped anybody. Mm. And you want to continue down the same lane of agony. Mm. Mm. I think that that makes sense because there is a lot of um, confusion both from a medical perspective and from a climate change perspective. But my curiosity was how do we approach this topic Spiritually. from a spiritual Spiritually. perspective? Of course, when you look at it from a climate perspective, the arguments are very, very forceful, There's extremely forceful. Yes. You probably can do nothing to arrest the whole thing of climate change uh, without reducing the level of animal slaughter and animal farming and these things. So that's from that direction. But from a spiritual perspective, you know, there's just a general disinclination mm. towards hurting you for my sake. Not because I fall in love with you, but because I know that I'm needlessly hurting. Mm. By hurting you, I will not gain anything. In fact, my condition would further deteriorate. So that's why. It makes me think that just like how there is a carbon footprint, mm. there should be a concept of spiritual footprint. Yeah. How much harm are we causing over time? It would require a very enlightened society. It's a beautiful thing you have just said. And I just hope we 
as a process of evolution and resolution come right. to a point right. where we could have a society that thinks on these lines wonderfully put there is um, there is this term called sanatan dharma i have never fully understood it but uh, it's maybe it has come up more in public conversations recently could you explain what that term means very scientific very scientific in fact it has nothing to do with the kinds of arguments and biases and uh, you know by gotry that uh, it is associated with so here we are as a species human beings and our defining characteristic is curiosity or as i have repeatedly said today a feeling of uh, discontentment and we have the required apparatus to support our curiosity in the form of the uh, very well evolved brain compared to other beings so right uh, from day 1 day 1 of the life of the first human being ever i know there is nothing called the first human being ever it's a continuous process yes but just you know hypothetically what has been present what has been the one thing in continuity unbroken continuity there is you there is me we have had our parents there were people before them and then there are our great and great and great ancestors irrespective of who they were and where they came from if they qualified to be called human beings mm. what is it that they had and we too have mm. what is it that is that one thing that 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 we definitely share as human beings mm. so biologically there is a lot of organs brain psychologically psychologically probably an increasing sense of agency i would say um because let's say 10 million years ago there were monkeys and somewhere around 3 to 4 million years ago we had homo erectus right, so they right. were using tools yes and they had opposable thumbs right, and they right. so somewhere around that time maybe we had more agency we could control our right so so, so everything has changed right yes they were not wearing any clothes they were just be- beginning to use tools yes they were just beginning to hold things yes huh? A- and they were exploring the world on two legs yes A- and these things were happening everything has changed what has not changed urges emotions mm, what is it that you and i ha huh. would have in common with that great ancestor of ours fear of death uh, yes and not have in common with any other species in oh. the world okay so there is something that the three of us share you me and that that, that ancestor and that ancestor and we don't share it with the with the fish with the birds hmm. with the dinosaurs with the insects we don't share it with anybody okay it's it's something private to our species what's it thoughts yes and what's it the basis of thoughts um love what I, i mean when do you think when you when you are deeply in love do you think no you don't in your in your deepest moment of joy do you think no when do you think when you are contemplative you are able to and why do we think if we don't think in joy what does that tell us about thought when do we think when there is a problem when, when there is a problem thought, when there is a problem and we are all the time thinking we are a thinking species yes we think much much more intensely than a monkey does their thinking even if it exists is very primitive yes so we think a lot and we are saying we think when there is a problem yes so you and i and that great ancestor we all are problemed hmm problemed ha huh? man is born with a problem yeah and that's what makes him think no other species is born with a problem it's the hard problem of existence hmm ha huh? hmm. the existentialist said to be or not to be yeah why should i live at all and then there were people who thought about it and meditated and said you know the purpose of life is liberation liberation from all this entire thinking hmm. huh? so that's sanatan sanatan means timeless eternal unending the ahams the self's quest for liberation that's sanatan dharma wow i have to say that in all the contexts in which that word has come out 
this meaning has never come out but there can be nothing but this right sanatan means that which is unbroken since the beginning of time euphemistically right and this is the only thing that is there we want liberation aham wants atma the falseness within wants to be relieved there is something uh, within that's constantly crying for the truth because it feels entrapped right and that's sanatan dharma to live life in a way that liberates you okay so how do we term these words sanatan advaita philosophy is one a subset of the other they are the same thing they are the same they are the same thing because liberation itself is liberation from imagined duality right right we are born with a feeling that i am and the world is Sem- and there is this dualistic separation right and i exist to consume the world and gain happiness from it right is that not our normal philosophy yes you are born to be happy we say the purpose of life is happiness and how do i be happy by by consuming the world by consuming the world huh? so that's the that's the primitive dualistic principle embedded in the body yes as you are born yes non duality is the pinnacle one has to reach duality is that you are born with so the very phrase hunter gatherer assumes that there is something to hunt and gather i got it we have remained hunter gatherers in that sense psychologically we have not evolved we remained hunter gatherers right <laughs> and so the purpose of sanatan dharma or advaita is to move beyond hunting gathering move hunting other wonderfully put and then so you are both the you are the one that is being gathered yes, you are the one that is yes, being yes hunting. yes yes so as long as we remain the way we are hmm. dharma 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 means that which is essential for you that which you must be and do that's dharma that which you must carry literally that's a literal word that which you must carry mm. huh? the obligation to be liberated is what you must carry always that's dharma i'm going to repeat that the obligation to be liberated to be liberated we have an obligation you have an obligation towards yourself hmm towards yourself hmm. otherwise you are wasting your own life hmm and it's not for anyone else no anybody actually there is no one else there is no one there else. is no one <laughs> you have to keep catching In yourself non- <laughs> <laughs> there is no one else so if you are obliged it's only towards yourself right <laughs> <laughs> and do you think it is possible to live like this you see there there is no template no model hmm. as i said we all are on our paths so there is nothing to copy when you say live like that then one is referring to a template to be copied correct there is nothing to be copied we we are here yeah there is this tea in front of me the last time i sipped it it has already gone cold <laughs> and i must catch myself reacting to the coldness which i find unpleasant and i must see what's what the way uh, this chemical is reacting to the temperature of this chemical you know there are chemicals that react only at certain suitable temperatures don't they yes <laughs> absolutely yes <laughs> and this chemical found the temperature unsuitable so the reaction was not as per the desire and i could uh, i have to catch that yes. and i have to do that all the time now if you were to do this with emotions yeah i'm sad i'm happy i am jealous i'm angry i have realized that in modern psychology a lot of therapy is exactly this which is if i am struggling and i don't know why and i sit in front of a therapist the therapist he or she will make me observe my emotions maybe make me write it down as a journal uh, until i have clarity over what i am going lovely, through lovely 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 ghum phir ke yahi pe aata hai right there there is no other therapy because there is no other disease the only disease inwardly is identification with what you are not Mm. no i am not my hand i am not my arm and i am not there for my chemicals and therefore i am not my feelings or emotions mm. but if i pretend to be my feeling or emotions that's as absurd as pretending to be my nail mm. i cannot be this nail fine there is this nail and i might have some relationship with it but being in a relationship mm. is very different from being that being that now as a doctor i have a dharma conflict 
which is my dharma is to treat that collection of cells and chemicals and i have to heal that body i have to heal that person and that person identifies with the disease that they have this conversation is almost impossible to have in a hospital right when somebody is coming in the midst of suffering they are too intertwined with the disease so it's not that they have experienced a heart attack eventually they are the one with a heart attack because that is their one must journey. not have the conversation there there is no need mm. that's why we talked of the three levels of reality mm. it's it's there is no point to initiating this conversation there but if this conversation becomes common place mm. the number of people coming to the hospital with heart attacks is likely to reduce can you tell me why would you say that we know i mean you know actually much better than i do what uh, cardiac uh, diseases are a result of mm. stress our lifestyle yeah i identify with my car so much if something happens to it mm. i feel pressure here mm. Mm. but if i can see the right relationship between me and that car mm. which is possible only if i first of all see the right relationship between me and this body mm. that occupies the car mm. then i am likely to feel a little less stressed irrespective of what happens to the car therefore the probability of me falling into the hospital yeah. uh, would be reduced yeah there is a there is a lot of truth to this because that conflict between uh, self and outside is actually what our brain is going through all the time all the time the source of stress is that my objective reality right. the objective reality does not match with my subjective reality and that causes conflict conflict and that conflict will always be there as long as there is an attempt to align the two now aligning two things is one thing Mm. Hmm? Seeing that the two are one is is totally different. Totally different. I see the difference. There is a unique struggle that the youth in our country are going through, which is uh, on the one hand they are deeply involved into social media, so they are into their phones, uh, into YouTube, all of that. On the other hand, they are also struggling with. conflicts in a turmoil and i have seen certain movements where they go towards spirituality and at least i feel that maybe they are not being guided in the best way possible with one recent example that came in our conversations was this it's called no fap mm-hmm. it is about this demonization of sexual thoughts mm-hmm. and there is a lot of correlations around it which is that you should not indulge in any sort of self pleasure and uh, this has been banned or this has been prohibited by our um our traditional spiritually yeah first of all is there any truth to that somebody who knows the anatomy and has studied medicine would be better place to say that but what i what i feel is that semen retention in itself sounds a pretty stupid term mm. you know the body knows what to retain and uh, what not to you cannot tell the kidneys what to retain and what to expunge you cannot tell your uh, uh, epidermal cells what to keep and what not uh, similarly usually no fap goes by the name of brahmacharya now that's where the problem is you see brahmacharya is about living in a way that leads you to brahm i I'll, i'll i'll explain that brahm is not a thing brahm is not a place no destination is brahm mm. brahm is to be understood only via negative brahm satya atma same same thing but no difference at all brahm simply means that which is not false not that which is truth because the truth as we said right in the beginning is unknowable agye hmm. therefore the 
प्रोसेस ऑफ वेदांत और अध्यात्म इज नेति नेति निगेशन सो लिव इन अ वे दैट डज नॉट री इन फोर्स योर फूलिशनेस दैट इज ब्रह्मचर्य चर्या रिफर्स टू लिविंग प्रैक्टिकली लिविंग ऑल द व्यवहार दैट यू डू थ्रू आउट द डे दैट चर्या चर्या चर मीन्स मूवमेंट वेन यू से चर चर कम इज मूवमेंट सो चर्या कम्स फ्रॉम देयर गॉड एट एंड ब्रह्म इज निगेशन ऑफ फॉल्सनेस सो लिव इन अ वे दैट कॉन्टिन्यूसली निगेट्स द फॉल्स Do not fall prey to the फॉल्स That's Brahmacharya. Beautiful. Hmm. And your own mind is continuously in an attempt to befool you. Yes. Hmm? Or rather, you are your own enemy. You are your own enemy. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> be on guard against yourself. Here in the foundation, we often say, "Hey, Ram, मुझे मुझसे बचा." Hmm. <laughs> so, so that's Brahmacharya. That's Brahmacharya. Mm, uh, uh, be cautious. You you will fool yourself. You know, that that is brahmacharya. Now, at least directly, that has nothing to do with viri raksha. Mm. No, no. Yeah. What these people have done is that they have equated bindu with semen. Now, bindu drop. Bund. That is a euphemism for something that is, but is not special. Just as you have a point, right? You can define space around the point. You can draw a circle around the point, but and you can also specify the point using coordinates. Yes. But can you ever put your finger on a point? That's impossible. Can you ever say here is a point? So a point. defines a space yet does not exist spatially hmm. right so in that sense as a pointer not as a, not in a very exact way but just as a pointer atma too was called bindu that it is present everywhere every point in space is a point is a point so it is present everywhere yet you cannot locate it anywhere right <laughs> present everywhere yet not detectable anywhere so that way the truth is bindu now <laughs> from that position they brought it down to mean a drop of semen and they said that brahmacharya is about veer raksha no, brahmacharya is not about veer raksha that does not mean that you have to go on masturbating endlessly right huh? all that is quite stupid Uh, but uh, brahmacharya is something very high very sublime it has a very uh, beautiful and tremendous connotation it cannot be equated with not masturbating no fap <laughs> so it almost sounds like there was a simplistic answer to a complex yes yes issue yes and that was uh, a peripheral mm. response to something that demanded that uh, you treat the very core now instead of treating the core that is full of desires mm. uh, let's say for women because the term is used mostly for men no fab now you don't want to examine why your mind is full of lustful thoughts yes instead you are directing the other in a very moral way not directing you're dictating actually Do not masturbate. How exactly is that going to help? Is that is that not stupid? I mean, <laughs> one should go into the mind and ask, why don't I have something better to do in life? Why am I always thinking of women? That's the core problem. Mm. You know, and why do I have so much spare time? <laughs> <laughs> you know, think of someone who is living rightly. Right. If he has spare time, spare energy. He would probably attend to his work, or go and run, or go and swim, or do something. Yeah. As a young man, because this again is something that is uh, pertaining to young men. As a young man, there is so much you have to do in life, and also you have the energy to maybe uh, spend in a gym or do something, and then you come and you crash. You you are already half asleep. Correct. 
So if you're living rightly, you're living rightly, no fap and other things become redundant. Mm. And if you're not living rightly, mm. then again, these things are not going to help. Mm. Uh, but uh, that pads actually, come and go. <laughs> that actually makes sense. Because if, um, because I have had patients who've come to me having seen some of these videos and they're very frustrated, they can't sleep and um, uh, they have had, they've gone through NoFab for two months, three months and uh, I've really had to explain to them the biology of how, what happens in the body. You know, you are approaching Brahmacharya. Mm. When you probably forget that you have not masturbated. If you are constantly remembering to not to masturbate, then you are already masturbating. You know, you don't always have to ejaculate to masturbate. Mm. It's going on in the head. Right. That's, that's very much masturbation. Just that the body is not uh, yet uh, <laughs> climaxing, but uh, the mind is full of lust. And that's masturbation, is that not? You are approaching Brahmacharya when all this lust, etc. Mm -hmm. becomes secondary. You come upon something so demanding, so beautiful, so urgent, so important, mm -hmm. so meaningful, that you forget all about uh, nonsense and other things in life. That's Brahmacharya. Right. Finding something that adds true purpose. Finding something that adds true. And when you are engaged in something purposeful, Mm. Who thinks of lust and such things? You know, you, ne you, all, you need to have a pretty barren life to be constantly thinking of uh, women and lust. Right. Today, in the, in the nation and across the world, Hinduism is going through a sort of a transition, which uh, I'm struggling to understand where is it going wrong with, of course, the core terms being Hinduism versus Hindutva. Where where did that turn happen and what is it that is going wrong and what should be the way back? It started with the emergence of uh, dualistic interpretations of Vedanta in the 11th and 12th centuries. Hmm. That process of dualistic interpretations continued right till 15th, 16th centuries. What is the dualistic interpretation? It's very interesting. Hmm? So, Vedant, which is actually Advait Vedant, that's how the entire world knows this. Huh? Advait is the Vedant. Hmm. But as you know, Advait is not the only Vedant. There are other interpretations of Vedanta. Yes. So, Advaita is total subjectivity. There is me. There is me. And I do not need anybody to attest that. Because that is the only thing I do not need anybody else for. If there is no me, who is asking this question? If there is no me, who is the sufferer? So, this much and only this much is certain, I am. Hmm. I might be false or whatever, hmm. but I am. Hmm. Even if I am false, I am. Hmm. In dualistic interpretations, which exist in India, which also exist across the world, if you look at, for example, the Abrahamic streams, they all are dualistic. Hmm. There you don't say only I am. There you say I am and there is the creator God. Hmm. In Advaita, even that is not. In Advaita, there is no creator God. Hmm. There is no creator God. Hmm. No God created this. Hmm. Huh? Not at least at the top level, Paramarthic level. At the Vyavaharic level, you can worship your favorite God, right. which is fine. So here, at the lower level, it might be polytheistic. Yes, yes. But at the higher level? At the highest level, there is just monism. Nothing else. Hmm. It's not even monotheistic. It's not even monotheistic. It is atheistic, definitely atheistic. In that sense, if you want. Yes. To, you know, otherwise, it can be used in a very disparaging sense also. Right. But but Advaita Vedanta says at the at the middle level, hmm. you are free to worship your favorite gods and goddesses. But a point comes when you have to realize 
that it's just you, the Supreme Self, and accept that there is no reality. So Satya, which is Atma and Brahma, that is beyond all the gods and goddesses that you worship. Mm. But that's not the way of the dualistic interpretations. What do they say? They say, I am. Mm. And I am this body. Mm. I am not the one who is looking at the body. I am the body itself. So that's the point from where all the dualistic schools start. In India and abroad. Mm. And because I am the body, therefore the universe has to be material. Yes. Because if I am the body, the sofa has to be real. If the sofa has to be real, this stage has to be real. So the, the, the ground beneath it, the earth has to be real. Other people have to be real. The other people have to be real and the entire universe then has to be real. So everything is real. Mm. And if all this is real, where does all this come from? Mm. If all this is real, it has to come from somewhere because if I am real, then the shirt that I am wearing came from a factory, a creator. Mm. Therefore, if I am real, the entire universe comes from a creator God. Mm. Logical. Logical? Very logical. The next problem is, nobody has seen that God. But I came from that God. So I need to have some history. So then I weave stories about my God. Mm. And the stories that you weave about your God mm. will never align with the stories that I weave about my God. Even if it's the same God. Even if it's the same God. Right. Therefore there will be conflict. Right. Now that's what is happening with Hinduism today. It is moving more and more in direction of stories. Mm. You have your stories and you want them to be believed as the truth. And if you do not believe in my story, then you are my enemy. Mm. So even inside Hinduism, because there are many, so there is Shaivism, there is Vishnuism, there is Shaktism, different people will follow different set of stories and teachings. They are fighting. Oh, there is tremendous conflict. Tremendous conflict. Between the Vaishnavas and the Shaivs. Yes. Tremendous conflict. And the reasons for the conflict almost... Same thing. Mm. I have my favorite God. Mm. I know what the God did. I have complete belief in my God. Mm. And my God is better than your God. Because he is God. He is the God. The God. He is the God. Your God is in fact not God at all. God at all. Not God at all. Mm. Out of just courtesy I might say mine your God. Mm. But in my heart I believe mine is the God. And you are mistaken. You are mistaken obviously. And someday you will realize. Someday you have to realize and I have to be a missionary who is out to proselytize you. Mm. Therefore I'll, I'll, I'll be on a conversion spree. Mm. And that's what Christianity and Islam has done. Mm. That's what people in India also want to do now. Mm. <laughs> mm. And this, this applies to my belief systems also. So the way I live my life is how you should live your life. How you should live your life. And Advaita does not... It is basically an expression of my ego, you see. Mm. Because he is my God, therefore he is the real one. You know, ego extending itself to that extent. He is the God because he is my God. My God. Mm. Hmm? Mm. This kid is the best because... He's my kid. He's my kid. This house is the best because it is my house. This country is the best because it is my country. Mm. Same thing. My national anthem won the best anthem award. Same thing. Same mm. thing. Just an expression of that good old ego. Mm. The old limbic system playing its role. Playing its role. At the highest stages. At the highest stages. With disastrous consequences. Mm. I think that made a lot of things click for me. You know, we, we talk of liberalism, Sanatan Dharma. Talks of liberation, not just liberty. Mm. Unfortunately, that same religion is turning into a den of dogma. Mm. We said in the early parts of our talk, there is nothing prohibited really, in, in Adhyatma or Vedanta, huh? all you are told to do is look at what you are doing. Mm. After that, it's your own game, your life, your choice. Mm. But please, do honestly look at what is happening. Mm. So, ours really is the pinnacle 
of liberalism when it comes to the various religions. And it's a sad thing to see that we are turning more and more, uh, you know what. So, my theory is that everyone will go towards the least effort path. And I feel that understanding non-duality takes effort, cognitive it's, effort. Oh, it, 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 not just cognitive effort, hurts. It hurts. It tells you that that which you think of as your life is not your life. That which you think of as your choice is not your choice. That which you think of as your love is not your love. It is just a chemical thing. So it is almost violent. It's almost violent. It humiliates. It strips yes. you down yes. to the core. Yes. And, and people run away. I experience it every day. Yes. <laughs> Irrespective of how much you want to sugarcoat it, it, it really bites. Yeah. It is not easy. Not there easy. was that story of Shankaracharya who had to, uh, who had to leave, and uh, his mom was yeah, uh, insisting that, story, that yes, 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 yes. Uh, and the crocodile comes in, and there was a story of he has to he has to give up his mom, his his family, in order to truly uh, go down. The that mother path. has to relieve him if his life has to be saved. Yes, and only then the mother says, "Fine, son, go, go." So that's the story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just I just remembered that. So yeah. that is hurtful. That's hurtful. There's a reason why people will not yes, go down yes, that path. Yes, yes, yes. But if you do not go down that path, it will hurt you all the more. What's the alternative? You know, we might opt for the easier route. It takes us nowhere. Yeah. So that's the only route. And and it's not a route. We said it's the pathless path. Nobody is dictating any terms, any paths uh, to anybody. That's a Buddhist. Uh, That's a Buddhist thing. It's a Buddhist thing. Yeah. So you have to look at it yourself. And uh, but the thing is, if you are honest in looking at yourself, what you will see would not be pleasant, at least initially. Mm. But one must have the 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 guts to stand that. No, mm. it's like entering into your own self. And discovering there is a dungeon uh, in there with a lot of rotten things mm -hmm. and a basement with, with full of primitive stuff that has decomposed and that needs to be cleared away. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Which, which brings us back to the first point that you said, which is spirituality, self-observation without bias. By, without bias. Without bias. And with a lot of love and courage. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that, that love, if you don't have that, then the bias would inevitably creep in. Yeah, That has brought us uh, incidentally to a very um, beautiful um, word that we have not used so far, not looked at so far, love. We often think of uh, Advaita as something dry, you know, <laughs> and we have spoken of it in uh, uh, those terms even today. It hurts, it bites, there is rigor and such things. It is, it's born out of love. All those things, the hurt, the bite, you can bear only if there is love. Love for the truth, love for yourself. Mm. Hmm? Love to know. Love to know. Mm. Only when you have that, that pulsation within, that the beating heart within, can there be unbiased self-observation? So it's not as if uh, the, the path of self-observation is a path devoid of love. No, no, no. It's a path that is founded on love. I think this is the feeling I would like to leave everyone with who is watching this, which is when you step out into this journey of self-observation, the, the feeling that you should have in you is one of love and curiosity to get to your own truth. Nothing else. You're not doing this for anyone else. As you said, there is no one else. And also you you, you need to be a little jovial, not too serious. Mm. You see, because you'll, you'll see unpleasant things when you come upon them. Yeah. If you become too serious about them. That's the beautiful thing about irony. Yeah. If you can appreciate irony. You'll have to smile at it. You see, otherwise uh, you will turn a hypocrite. Right. <laughs> it's the nature of ego. The nature of ego. You you will look at things uh, that stink. Now, unless uh, you just make a joke of them, 
or you will have to deny their existence and get into all uh, kinds of subversions. Yes. Hmm? So, <clears throat> one must be able to accept oneself as a fool. Hmm? I'm an idiot, I'm a fool mm. and I'm happy with that, I laugh at myself. Mm. Uh, yes, I do things that are uh, very stupid mm. and an even greater stupidity is that I often do not see things <laughs> as as stupid and uh, ha 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 correct <laughs> there is this instinct in all of us to be so prim and proper all the time mm. but there's not one has to take himself lightly right who am I I love it as soon as you <laughs> said that I relaxed <laughs> 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 oh man Acharya ji thank you so much for this um, I realized that we could have an entire night of conversation. Oh, I Between really science that. and spirituality, there is so much to intervene. You know, I have spent so many nights doing just that. So many nights. So many. And I have been privileged to have people who could tolerate me all night. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. I'm, I'm going to be having another conversation with you. Um, it will be a shorter one, but that will be specifically on Bhagavad Gita. Right. Uh, to dive into my own curiosities, we are going to take a little tour down chapter right. 1 to 18, right. but I will see you in that one. Right.